well. So why Titus? Why right now? The reason is because the first three verses of Titus, chapter 1, which is what we're going to look at and just walk through, it does a good job at reminding us of some of the foundational elements of the gospel, which is the foundation upon which we all stand as believers. But it also does a good job at showing the correlation uh, between the gospel and godliness. Okay, godliness. Now, we're going to get into godliness a little bit more in a moment, but just to remind us here, godliness, in its, in its most basic essence, is a lifestyle, it's behavior that accords with, can you guess it? With who? To be godly is to be like, yeah, God, Christ, that's okay. Uh, Christ is God. Uh, but the idea here is that God, a godly lifestyle um, is going to be a lifestyle that, has, that exudes the character of who God is. So his, his character, but also his actions, his thoughts, his words, all that kind of stuff. That is what it is to be godly. And it's important to understand the correlation between the gospel and godliness, which is what we're going to look at as we go through. So let's do this. A quick, brief understanding of the context of Titus. Because the book of Titus is an occasional letter. What that means, it's very basic, is this. In the same way that when I was younger, I wrote a note to someone in school, that was an occasional letter, which means I'm not writing. When I wrote that note to this person in, in elementary school, I wasn't writing it as an objective document for all people for all time. That wasn't, the, that wasn't the purpose. The occasion was I wanted this person to know something, or I wanted this person to know something about what just happened. It's very uh, socially, historically situated, and that's the same with Titus. Titus was a letter written by Saul, or Paul, same guy, to his co-worker named Titus, who at this time was in the island called Crete, okay? And Crete is an island, quite a large island, which is in the Mediterranean Sea, and in some of Saul's sort of missionary adventures, there were some churches planted on this island, and Titus was left there. So this, mess, this letter is for Titus, who was left in Crete, and Paul is saying, hey, Crete is full of pagans, and these pagans in Crete have a notorious, um, are just notorious for being deceivers, liars, and drunkards. Okay? It's not really an island that you or I would want to go vacation on at that time, right? So there's these churches that are planted there in the midst of a culture that is deceptive and lying and getting drunk all the time. So you have Paul writing to Titus to say, you need to put some order in these churches because there are some false teachers that are obviously being influenced from the culture that are kind of seeping into the churches. So you need to reject the false teachers the false teachers, bring in the true doctrine, the sound, healthy doctrine, and we want to see the opposite of ungodliness going on amongst the churches there, which is going to be godliness. So that's kind of the basic idea of the letter of Titus. So it's very practical. It's very theological in the sense that here's the gospel, because the gospel has to accord with godliness, or the godliness has to come from the gospel, and then here's how practical we get. Like, if you look at the beginning of chapter 2, you can see the practical nature. Okay, hey, these are what the older women should be doing in your churches. It's like, this is what the young men should be doing. Like, it's very practical because they are fighting against a current of ungodliness, drunkenness, lying, and deception that is going on there. So that's kind of the basic context of the letter. Does that make sense a little bit? Okay, let's jump into the letter. So this is what it says. I'm going to read this, the first little bit of the first verse. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, Pretty basic. Here you have Paul saying who he is, right? And he's saying two things about who he is. The first thing is what? He's a servant of God, and then he says that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Let's look at those briefly in turn. Firstly, you have him as a servant of God. What I think is so good about this is that at the time, in sort of the church culture, Saul, or Paul, was quite a significant figure, right? Quite a significant figure. Everyone kind of knew that about him, and yet... He's approaching his co-worker Titus, and through Titus, the church in Crete, humbly. Not presumptuously, not as Paul, the man that you shall listen to because of my authority. He comes in as what? A servant of God. A slave of God. He's not coming in to press his own agenda. 
You know, ideally speaking, a servant and a slave ought to do the will of who? Their master, right? So here is Paul saying, I'm a slave of God. So what I'm saying to you here and what I hope that you do because of what I say isn't because I have all the best ideas in my brain of mine and I'm going to make sure that we have this perfect culture here. He's saying, no, no, I'm coming as a servant and a slave of God to do the will of God. So that's important that we see that at the beginning. The next thing that he says about himself correlates with the servanthood of God. He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, the word apostle is very basic in, in terms of its literal meaning. It just means a sent one, one that is sent, a messenger. Now, you could subjectively make that mean any, anything you want. But we see something important when he says specifically that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, look at that word Christ. Now, we've spent a, maybe the last two months, different kind of sermons, we've been looking at the emphasis and the importance of that title, Christ. Because I think as most of us ought to know, and if you don't know, then this is important for you to know, that Christ is not like, you know, my last name, Dagno, Isaac Dagno, Jesus Christ. It's not the same understanding. Christ is a title. It's a position, right? And what that position is, is it's to be this, the title of the prophesied, anticipated, divine agent from God that would come from the descendants of the tribe of Judah within Israel, specifically from the descendants of David, who would end up being the ruler of the king's on earth, who would be the one that would sit on Mount Zion as king, not only of Israel, but through Israel to the entire world in a reign and a rule that is righteous, that is perfect, that is never going to be subject to decay, never going to be subject to bribery, never going to be subject to, you know, abuses in any way, no tyrannical reality. So everything that we might look at with different dictatorships in history, and maybe even today, we say, we never want that. We need to have democracy. Well, listen, the Bible says that in the last days, it's not going to be democracy, and we should all be like, that's so good, because we know what's in the heart of the people. What's in the heart of the people? Sin, evil, that's the heart of the people. But what God has designed from the beginning is this person, the Christ would come and set up a government, a government that is gonna be pure and righteous and perfect. And I might wanna remind us of that passage in 2 Samuel where David, the King, da King David over Israel before he dies, <coughs> he talks about the beauty and the sort of the wisdom that sets on the people when a king rules well. And he uses very poetic language, and I find it very kind of tantalizing, where he says, when a, a, a ruler rules well, in the fear of the Lord, when a ruler rules well, it is like the dew on the morning grass, like the sun rising over the darkness. You know, he gives this something like that. It's a very poetic language to say that when a king rules justly, when a dictator, you could say, dictates properly and righteously according to God, what's it going to do to the people? What's it going to do to the environment? It's going to cause it to bloom. It's going to cause it, the people and the whole environment, the whole context, to be beautiful and perfect. And this is God's desire for Christ. The Christ is a very governmental position. If you go back and read Psalm 2, which is a very messianic psalm, meaning it's talking about the Christ, because Messiah and Christ are basically synonymous, I mean the anointed one. If you read Psalm 2, you'll see how God is saying, listen, I have my Christ. I'm just paraphrasing that one. I have my Christ, and I am setting him up as my king on the holy hill of Mount Zion, and every single king on this earth ought to submit to him before it's too late. Because he does rule with a rod of iron. And if you find your refuge in him, if you submit to him, you will be saved and you can find protection under this king. So it's a very, I just want to emphasize the kingly reality of the position of Christ. So when Paul mentions, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, it's a very, yeah, very political kind of phrase he's making here. It's basically the same as saying, I am an ambassador, I am an emissary of King Jesus. Does that make sense? So when Paul is here on earth, and the kingdom is not of this world, when he's on earth and he's going around, he's going as a representative of King Jesus. To make King Jesus' will known. 
to make the news about King Jesus known. Does that make sense? He's an apostle. So this is all under the servanthood of God. What is the way that Paul serves God? He serves God being an ambassador of God's Son. Jesus the Christ, the divine agent, to bring judgment and to bring restoration to the whole world. That is who we're dealing with. And when Paul comes, he's coming as an apostle, which tells us what? Right off the top of this letter, so Paul wants Titus, and through Titus, the whole church, to understand and know that Paul's not coming with his own agenda. He's not coming with his good ideas. He's coming with Jesus Christ's agenda and Jesus Christ's will. Then we read this in verse 1. For the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. Now, your translation might have something a little bit different at the beginning of there. Uh, my translation says, for the sake of. It's like four words that are trying to translate one Greek word, which is the preposition kata, which at its very basic meaning means according to, or in relation to, in harmony with. Now, my translation sort of sees that as, um, as sort of a goal-oriented, purpose-oriented idea, which means what? It means that Paul is saying, my servanthood under God, which involves this apostleship from Jesus Christ, is for the purpose of something. And that makes sense logically. If I'm a servant of someone, I'm their representative, then the purpose would be that I go and make their purpose and will known. We've already said that, right? So this word kata here is basically just helping us understand that his apostleship is not something that he's designing. It's not in relation to something that he just gets to make up, right? You know, you have people today, and I don't want to, I don't want to, um, take a large paintbrush over all of this, but I know that we can say that there are some people today that take the title apostle, take the title prophet, take the title pastor, elder, even the title of a Christian, and it's in relation to something that is not what God desires, but it's something that they've authored themselves. And they go about, even sometimes around the world, making known their will and not God's will. But here we have Saul confessing, Paul saying that my apostleship is in accordance with something that God desires. It's related to something that I didn't choose. It's something that God wants. So what are those things? He gives two things. The first thing that his apostleship is related to, is concerned with, is the faith of God's elect. Do you see that? It's in relation to the faith of God's elect. Now faith, we can understand faith as trust. We can understand it as belief, right? That's what faith is. And specifically, Saul, Paul's apostleship is concerned with the trust and the belief of the disciples of Jesus, of God's elect ones. Now, what I love about this is this. The most valuable thing that you have, like if God were to write up uh, a, an assessment, like a, a property assessment on your life, what are the most what are the most valuable assets that you have? Some of you might say, oh, my wedding ring or my property or whatever. Do you know what God would say is your most valuable, treasured asset that you have? It's your faith. It's your trust. That is the most important thing. And here's why. Where are you, if I can use this language, where are you spend your faith, where are you uh, deposit your trust, doesn't just have value in this life, but ultimately has value in the next. So where you place your faith today and tomorrow is going to have a massive, massive implication for your life in the next. And when you compare your life in this present age to your life in the next age, your life in this present age is like this. That's it. And then you have your whole eternal life in the next. And where you put your faith now has massive ramifications then. That's why it's the most valuable thing. Who cares about your property in one sense? When you think about it in comparison, your, your money, your stuff, your, even just like your family, your relationships, your influence, your power. Listen, all that's going to go. But what's going to be most important is where you're putting your faith, where you're going to put your trust. And so we can see under God, under Jesus Christ, Paul is going to, to take hold of that which is most valuable. 
again, we can see that in comparison to other people that take on the name of apostles and prophets today that unfortunately go for other people's assets. But here you have Paul going for what's most critical and most important, and that is the faith of God's elect. Now, he's going to develop more faith because faith has to have an object. No one can just have faith, period. It's always faith in something. It has to be faith in an object. And we're going to come to find very soon that we're talking about God, Jesus, the gospel, and so on. We'll get to that in a moment. So that's the first thing that his apostleship is in accordance with, the faith of God's elect. Are you, are you following? Is this making sense? I feel like I'm just like going like a power right now, but I think some of you, Loella, you nodded your head, so I'm, I'm just going to, you're the representative of the people right now, Loella. Um, the next thing that Saul's, Paul's apostleship is in accordance with is their knowledge of the truth. Knowledge of the truth. When Paul is going as an emissary of, of Jesus to all the different Gentile communities that he's going to, he is going because he's concerned with their understanding and their growth and their gaining of the truth, of the truth. Now, when Paul talks about the truth, I hope this goes without saying, but he's not talking about, he just wants to go and make sure that people understand the truth of gravity or the truth that if you smile at someone, you'll brighten their day. Like, those are just regular things that, you know, we all know to be true. What Paul is talking about when he says the knowledge of the truth is the truth of the gospel, the truth of God. I think back to another letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, which was in modern day Turkey. And he tells them that they've gained a hope, which they've heard about from the, and he talks about it as the word of truth, which is the gospel. That's in Colossians chapter one, verse five. You've You've discovered this hope from the word of truth, which is the gospel. So the message of truth, the knowledge of truth is what? It's the good news of Jesus. It's the good news of God. So how do these, how do these two things relate to each other? If Paul's going for the faith of God's people and for the knowledge, their knowledge of the truth, what we are seeing here is that he is saying, I'm going after the people, so that they would put their most valuable asset they have, their faith, in the truth. And in order for them to properly put their faith in the truth, they have to understand it. They have to have a knowledge of the truth so they can put their faith in it. That's the most important thing. And that's what Paul's out to do. Now notice what Paul does when he, after he writes about the knowledge of the truth. He has to say something else, especially because he's writing to those in Crete, and remember the Cretans, what's their sort of society like? Do you remember? Not very godly. Ungodly. Lying, drunkenness, things like that. He says that this knowledge of the truth, notice at the end of verse 1, is in accordance with what? What does your translation say? It's accords with what? And what is it? Godliness. That's right. It accords with godliness. This is a very basic point that Paul is making. All he's saying is this. The truth... Okay, knowledge of the truth aligns with, okay, brings about the godliness of the believer in this truth. If you believe in this truth and you live by it, it's going to align with godliness. What is godliness? Godliness, like we said at the beginning, is basically a lifestyle that follows God. It's a lifestyle that it has the same character, the same qualities of God. Now that can sound very, if I just say, be godly. I mean, again, that's very subjective, right? You could sort of, you could basically say, make anything work. So let's come out of theoretical, abstract land. Let's get to something concrete. And I believe that even within this letter that Paul wrote to Titus, he brings about some very specific things which are practical realities of godliness. So let's just look. If you go to down to verse 7 of chapter 1, Paul is talking to Titus to say, these are the kind of elders, pastors, overseers that you ought to put sort of in charge of these churches so that they can look at these elders and mimic their life. Basically, what he's saying is pick godly elders. How does he describe godly elders? Look at verse 7. Halfway through, we see this. He must not be arrogant. There's a very practical thing. So not proud. Okay? Some of you might think, well, how do I know if I'm proud? Ask someone. <laughs> and tell them, I promise I won't get mad at you. Just tell me, am I a proud person? And hopefully they're honest and they'll tell you, okay? Uh, uh, what does it say here? So, he must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. Quick-tempered. That's important. Quick-tempered. That means someone does something to you and you instantly are at level 10 rage, okay? Quick-tempered. 
Okay, some of you are laughing, Marguerite. Maybe we can talk after. Um, <laughs> quick tempered, notice next, or a drunkard. Very easy to understand that. You're not getting drunk. I almost feel, I was talking to a pastor a friend of mine a little while ago about certain immoral things. And we've, I just, I, I thought, and maybe we'll do this eventually, but I almost felt like some of us may take it for granted that many people, even within the church, don't maybe know some of these practical areas that are actual sins. When it comes to maybe living with someone before marriage, for instance, or, or drunkenness, or this or that. And I feel like a lot of people just kind of have maybe forgotten or they haven't heard that before. We almost need to just, just be straight and say, look, these are some areas that are ungodly. And if we are in some of those areas, then let's quickly, let's, let's get out of those places gently and properly uh, with the help of others. But drunkenness is one of those things that some people might think, oh, really? I thought it was okay. But here we have it as, uh, as an actual lifestyle behavior that is not in accord with godliness. So we have drunkenness. We also have violence or greedy for gain. Continue on in verse 8. They, they ought to be hospitable, which means that, like, hey, they're open to have people in their vicinity, and they're going to give them food, right? Hospitable, a lover of good, self-control, that's a massive one, upright, holy, and disciplined. These are all realities of godliness, okay? Realities of godliness. Um, if we look over in, let's say, chapter 3, verse 8, we also see that after he gives sort of a gospel synopsis, which we'll get into in a moment, he says, I'm saying all these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Good works. And that's also an outcome of godliness. So godliness is all those characteristics that an elder ought to be, including the good works that just flow out from that kind of life. Does that make sense? That's what it is to be, to be godly. So I wanted to say this at this point, because... What Paul is saying here to us, to, to Titus, and you know, Holy Spirit is saying to us, he's saying that the knowledge of the truth that your faith is to be put into, it has to accord, and it does accord with a godly life. And I just want to say this. If there is an area in your life where you know is ungodly, and if I'm being honest, I'll put up my hand and say, you know what, I, I, can, I can understand an area that is maybe not as godly as it ought to be, is ungodly then there's, there's other two things at play. And it's good just to be straight up with this, not sugarcoat it. There's two things at play if there's an area in your life or my life where there's ungodliness. Two things, one of two things. Number one is this. I have faith and I have trust, but it's in a false gospel. It's in a, so there, there's no issue with faith in and of itself. No, I believe in something, but it's not right. For example, if my understanding of the gospel is, God, your blood has washed me, I can do what I want and I don't need to fear you because you've, I have grace and I can go and live an ungodly life. Or this ungodly part of my life, you're going to cover. See, if I believe that as part of a gospel, as an objective reality of the gospel, how is that going to play out in this area of my life? I can just keep doing it and not worry about it. Do you see? So it's not an issue of my faith or my lack of trust. It's an area of something that needs to be tweaked in my understanding of the good news of the knowledge of the truth. Does that make sense? So the other way though, the other reason why there might be ungodliness is that there's nothing wrong with your understanding of the true gospel. You understand God's justice, you understand his mercy, you understand the blood of Jesus washing you, you understand all of this, it's just a matter of your lack of actually believing in it. It's your lack of truly getting hold of it. And so, and here's the thing, for all of us, we're always going to be dealing with these things, but it's good to have that in mind, to, to come before God and say, look, I recognize that there's still areas that I'm lacking belief in this area of your gospel for me. Help me today to believe it. And also saying at the same time, I also understand that me and my little brain, I'm not going to be so presumptuous to think that I understand the gospel better than anybody else. So, Lord, give me humility today to change my beliefs in accordance with your word so that I actually am trusting in the true gospel. And I guarantee that if we, if we do that every single day, if we humble ourselves before God and say, God, help me my faith. God, help me understand the gospel better. God, help me live a godly life which is in accordance with the knowledge of the truth. Then ungodliness is just more and more going to be weeded out of your life. And that's awesome. Okay, let's continue on. 
In verse 2, we see this, in hope of eternal life. In hope of eternal life. What's he saying here? He's saying this. Paul is saying, my apostleship, I'm Paul right now, my apostleship, my emissarial, that's a word, duties as a diplomat of Jesus the King, my apostleship relates to and is for the purpose of the faith of God's elect in the knowledge of the truth, and this is what he's saying now, which is based on, it's in, it rests on what? What do you see at the beginning of verse 2? What is it? What is the faith and the truth resting on? The hope of eternal life. Right now, what Paul is doing here is he's giving us the foundational foundation of, 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 of faith, of the knowledge of the truth. And it is the hope of eternal life. If you, in your Bibles, flip back or scroll up a, a little bit, two pa- probably two pages, and you'll get to the beginning of 2 Timothy. So go there. Just go back two pages, and you'll get to 2 Timothy. And if you go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, this is another letter that Paul is writing to a co-worker, not Titus, but another T name, Timothy. And notice how he begins the very first sentence of this letter. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of what? What does it say? Of life. That's right, the life that is in Christ Jesus. And what is the life that he's referring to here? Is that just sort of an abstract idea of, oh, like, life? No, we know what he's talking about here. We know that he's talking about eternal life because you just go down to verse 10 of chapter 1 in 2 Timothy, and about halfway through verse 10, we see him talking about our Savior Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher. What is eternal life then? What is eternal life that he's talking about here? That, 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 our, that our faith and the knowledge of the truth rests on. What is eternal life? Eternal life is living forever with God, the Father, and Jesus, the Lamb, and the Holy Spirit, who's already in our midst, praise the Lord, living forever with God in a resurrected, immortal body that is not subject to decay and pain. Does anyone want to say Amen to that, that is not subject to anything, which actually, like we learned about last week, can, can live forever in a renewed heavens and earth where righteousness dwells. That's what eternal life is. It's tangible. It's real. It will have tastes and sights and feels. That's eternal life. And what we come to find when we read the Bible, when we understand God's story of redemption, is that just like we, I'm taking this from last week's sermon, I'm kind of plagiarizing my own sermon from last week, that's okay. But in Romans chapter five, verse 12, we know that death came in when sin came in and it corrupted, death spread, right? There was a blockage to this eternal life because of sin, because sin barred us from this relationship with God and messed up our bodies so that we can't live forever. So we know that to be the case. And we know in Romans eight, that even all of creation is affected because of our sin. That even the, 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 the sun and the stars and the mountains and the, the flowers ache because the flowers that we pull up from the ground and put in a vase should never die, never decay, right? They ought to live forever. So even creation itself is groaning for the day when they will see the redemption of the sons of God, which is going to be you and me when we get our redeemed bodies. This is what we talk about when we're talking about eternal life. Eternal life. And this is what the gospel is all about. And I want to show us that in a moment here because if the hope of eternal life is the foundation upon which the truth sits and our faith is in, how does it all connect? Because it's one thing to build a foundation over here, like for a house, and then build my house over here. And I think this is how a lot of us as Christians maybe live sometimes, which doesn't make any sense. We, we live in this house and it seems all okay. We look out our window, we see a foundation over there, but how many of us would know that this, as soon as a storm comes, as soon as a heavy wind comes or heavy rainfall, what's gonna happen? The house is automatically gonna come down. It wouldn't make any sense to take the house off of that which it must be founded on. 
And what we see here is the house must be founded on this hope of eternal life. And some of you may be thinking, shouldn't you be saying Jesus? Of course, and we're going to get to that in a moment. Because you can't separate eternal life from Jesus because Jesus is life. Okay? So this is what I want to do. I want to connect these things together. And to do that, I want us to go to chapter 3 of Titus, starting in verse 3. And in verse 3, what, what Paul is going to do in verse 3 is he's going to talk about the culture of death in which we live because of sin. Okay? It's the culture of death. It's the culture of, you could say, ungodliness. And unfortunately, it was the culture of Crete at the time as well. And this is what Paul says. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Now, if any of us in here are going to be honest, does this maybe describe your life before you came to know Jesus? Or at least aspects of it? I certainly can say absolutely. Even after coming to Christ, I'm like, my goodness, there's just some areas in here that I still need to kind of grow on, right? So this is ungodliness here. This shows us the need for life, the need for hope, and the need to put your faith in something other than yourself. Because this kind of person who's foolish, disobedient, led astray, are not going to be able to make it, okay? Then look what happens in verse 4. Now in verse 4 of Titus 3, we're going to begin to hear about the knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness that we are to put our faith in. This is what Paul writes. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. He saved us. He saved us from what? Saved us from death. Saved us from sin. And He saved us from the consequence of those things, which is eternal death. And just to pause there for a moment, go to... I know we're kind of going all over in Titus. That's okay. Titus chapter 2, verse 14 shows us the way, the particular way that he saved us. In verse 14, he talks about our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us. So how did God save us because of his loving kindness? How did he save us? By Jesus Christ giving himself for us. Putting himself in the place of death, putting himself in the place of sin, putting himself in the place of hell, you could even say, in our place as a substitution. That is the crux of the salvation of the gospel, is that Jesus Christ bled and died for us. We've got to keep that central. When Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, I, I'm relating to you what's of utmost importance. What's the first thing he says about the gospel? That Christ died for your sins and was buried in accordance with the scriptures. It's the very first thing that Paul says, because it's so essential that we understand the redemption, the substitution that took place at the cross. Okay, go back to Titus 3, verse 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness. It wasn't because of my righteous works, but because of the righteous work of Jesus, who humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Not works, his. But according to his own mercy, his merciful work, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become, listen, heirs according to what? What does it say at the end of verse 7? Heirs according to what? The hope of eternal life. Verse 8, the saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. So this substitution that took place with Jesus, when we, that's the truth, when we put our faith, remember that's what Paul's after, the faith is the most important thing about us, when we put our faith in that truth of what God has done for us in his first appearing, we become justified in God's sight. He says, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you and I'm for you. You're good because you're looking upon the good, merciful work of of my son Jesus Christ, who bled and died for you. And what does that justification bring about? It brings about one of the best things that you and I have today, is reconciliation with God. Before you are an enmity with God, there's, just, there's been times, my wife's not here, but she would be okay with me saying this, there are times, like any of you who are married or have a close friend would know, sometimes there's some distancing that happens because of an issue. And there's a little bit of enmity, there's a little bit of like distance. You know what I'm talking about. You totally know. 
But then there comes that moment, and hopefully it's come to you before, there comes a moment where through forgiveness, through communication, through whatever means, it's broken and there's reconciliation again. How many of you can testify that that's probably one of the best feelings ever? That's right. It's, the, it's so good. Now imagine that same thing with the most important relationship in your life. And that is relationship with God who created you. The God who made you. Jesus' death on the cross brought about justification, which brings about your peace with God. Reconciliation with God. And that's amazing. But here's what I want to note about this sort of uh, concise gospel truth that we just read in chapter 3 of Titus. Two things to note. Number one, and this is really important. Note this, that the gospel did not merely bring about our reconciliation with God in this present age. In fact, I would even go so far as to say that that wasn't the ultimate main thing, although it perfectly relates to the main thing. The main thing is what we read about in chapter 7. Your justification by his grace is for what purpose? So that, this is just straight from scripture here, so that we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's the crescendo of the gospel message. Our reconciliation with God is for eternal life with God. Right? That would be like my wife saying that our engagement to be married was the big thing. It's like, no, no, no. This, this coming together is important, but it is leading to something you could say is even better. Does that make sense? It's about the hope of eternal life. The next thing to note from this is this. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but now I'll kind of um, detail it a little bit more. Is this. Our hope of eternal life, which our faith rests on, the truth rests on, this hope of eternal life is totally inseparable from the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? Totally inseparable. Because sometimes, if we're always emphasizing the gospel is about your eternal life in a new body, in a new earth, sometimes we might conceive that as sort of apart from a relationship with Jesus. But that was never in the mind of Paul nor any of the early apostles as they preached. Because it's the very coming of Jesus that will actually bring about this new body, the resurrection. And we see that clearly, for example, in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, where Paul says, we are waiting for our blessed hope. We see that. Our blessed hope, which is what? The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you see that? So this hope of eternal life is absolutely, totally, unbreakably connected to Jesus. Our eternal life is going to be in the presence of Jesus. Totally the same. The one that said, I am the resurrection and the life, is the one that gives us the hope of eternal life with him forever. Does that make sense? So, saying that, I'll say this. If you're, and I want us to be humble here, right? And vulnerable, and ready to be, to grow and learn and be corrected. If our gospel, I'm speaking to myself too, doesn't have the hope of eternal life in the glory of Jesus Christ as the foundation of my gospel, then I need to humbly reorient my gospel so that that is the foundation. Does that make sense? It's got to be the foundation. This hope of eternal life that we inherit because of our reconciliation with God the Father. All right, let's continue on here. We're, we're almost there. This is, you guys are doing good. Okay. Continue on in verse 2. So in the hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Paul's making a simple point saying this. The God, who I'm a servant of, Paul is saying, this God, he's the one that promised this hope of eternal life before the ages began. Which means it wasn't just this, this, this hope that he gave on one day. Right? He gave it before the ages began. It's been eternally there. But what, is, what does Paul say here? This is a question I want to ask you. What does he say in verse 2 that would cause Titus and us today to be encouraged to believe in this hope of eternal life? What, can you notice anything that he would say there that would just promote that the God who promised this is going to bring it to pass? What does he say here? What's that? God doesn't lie, as opposed to those Cretans, right? That are always deceiving, and those false teachers, this God doesn't lie. 
He never lies. So Paul is saying, look, this pro- like, you can understand something about this promise of the hope of eternal life. Not only was it brought into existence, eternity passed before the ages began, but it's proceeded from the mouth of the God who is always faithful, who never lies. My goodness, how many lies have you told in your life? So many. How many times have you twisted the story even 1% in your favor? Like, how many times have we manipulated, even if it's been a little bit? My goodness, too many, right? Yet the God who promised the most important thing about the foundation of the gospel is a God who never lies, who will bring it to pass, which tells us what about this hope? This hope of eternal life is not a hope that you hope happens. It's a hope that is secure and firm and established, which means you and I are never put to shame when we say to those that don't believe, I have no worries dropping everything in this life. I have no worries not worrying about saving my life for the sake of the hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Because my hope is not a hope that I'm hoping in. It's a hope that is confirmed. Because my God never lies. Verse 3, and at the proper time, he manifested this message of eternal life in his word through the preaching. So what is Paul saying here? He's simply saying that this hope of eternal life is encapsulated in what's called the word, the message of God, which is the word of, which is the word of life, right? We read in 1 John chapter 1, the word of life. We read in Philippians chapter 4, verse 16, the word of life. It's the message of eternal life. That's what the truth is. It's the message of eternal life. And how does Paul say it proceeds to people? If I have a message that has to do with words, how is it given to someone else? This is very basic logic. If I gotta tell Lance something that's really important, if he's driving down the road and he doesn't know that around the corner there's a washout, how do I relay that information to Lance? Through words. I have to tell him, Lance, stop the car, right? Stop, it's through word. That's why he says the word is given through what? The preaching, or your translation might say the proclamation. That word in the Greek is kerygma, which sort of encapsulates that body of truth that was given from the apostles to the church, which we hold to. And that's how the message is given out, through the preaching, through the kerygma, through this knowledge of the truth, which rests on the hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus. And then lastly, we read this, with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Paul is saying, look, this just circles right back to him saying that I'm a servant of God. He's saying, that Jesus, this king, is the one sending me on this message, commanding me to relay this kerygma, to relay this proclamation of eternal life to everybody, everybody. It's God's command for me. Now, as I was looking at that this week, I thought, the fact that God himself commands Paul, and through Paul, all of us, really, to go and bring this kerygma, this proclamation of the word of life to all the world. What does that tell us about the heart of the Father, if that's his command to us? It tells us, very simply, that God desires every single person on this world to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. If that's his command, and that is his command, that everyone here, that everyone get the call, like the illustration with Lance, that everyone has the call to say, don't turn the corner. Trust in this other route to take you where you need to be for life. If you flip back a little bit more than last time to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I want you to see this. It's so important. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Pardon me. 1 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 3, we have Paul saying this. God our Savior desires, listen to this language, he desires all people to be saved and to come to the, and here's the phrase, knowledge of the truth. That's his desire. That's the heart of the Father. Understand that today. The heart of the Father is that all would come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Very similar language to the opening words of Titus. And then he says in verse 7, For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. 
I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. Right? A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So we see this as the heart of the Father. Now here's how we can wrap up now. Go back to Titus, and we'll wrap up here. There's two questions I want to ask you as we apply this text to us today. Two questions. Maybe they're not questions. <laughs> Maybe there are there's statements that you question, okay? Here's the first statement I want to suggest to you. Check your gospel. Even right now. I know we're getting hungry. I know it's hot. But just take a moment in your mind right now and check your gospel. What do you, what do you believe in about this Jesus? What is it? Check your gospel. What, what do you believe about hope? What is your hope in? What do you believe about your reconciliation with God right now? What is it? Because as we've learned from the beginning of Titus and other places, is that that really matters. Is it resting? Is it founded upon the hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus? Is that enabled because of your reconciliation with God, because you've trusted in the blood of Jesus to wash away your sins and forgive you? Check your gospel. One author this week, as I was doing some reading, suggested a really concise summary of the kerygma, of that proclamation. And it's found in Hebrews chapter 9, just two verses, I'm going to read it, you don't have to go there, but if you want to write it down, you can. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28, we get a really concise summary of the apostolic kerygma, which is like the message that the apostles gave, which is about the hope of eternal life. And this is what uh, whoever the writer of Hebrews is says. He says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. That is what the apostles preached. That this Messiah came once, first, for the sake of sin. To show mercy upon you. To wash away your sins humbly on a cross and died for you. But he's also coming again. He's coming again not to deal with sin, meaning he's not coming again as a gentle lamb, but as a roaring lion. To, to fight off Satan, the Antichrist, and all unbelievers to protect who? You and me. And to lead us into salvation, which is the realm of eternal life. And notice what he says at the very end, that he's coming to save who? Those who are eagerly waiting for him. And if I could give you today a definition of faith, I would say faith is eagerly awaiting Jesus. If you truly trust and have faith in and believe in Jesus and what he's done, that means that you are going to be eagerly waiting for him. Check your gospel. Does it fit in that kerygma? And if not, then just, it's okay. Be corrected. It's good to be corrected. Humble yourself and say, God, I want to be firm on your gospel. Second thing to check is this, and then we're done, I promise. Not only check your gospel, check your godliness. Check your life. W what is your lifestyle? When we read through some of these things, are, do you find yourself godly? Where are areas in your life where there's not godliness? And then ask yourself the questions that we asked earlier in the sermon. Is it because the gospel that I believe in is actually false? and it allows me to be ungodly? Or is it because there's areas where I just need more encouragement by your spirit to believe and actually really put my faith in the true gospel? Check your life. Check your godliness. Some of us might be asking, and I ask this, how can I be trained to be godly? What can I do to be more and more godly? That's a good question to ask ourselves, and this is where we'll end, is on this one passage in Titus chapter 2. Verse 11. Look at it with me. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. There you go. How do you train yourself for godliness? By meditating, reflecting, and orienting your life around the mercy of Jesus, the grace of Jesus in his first coming. 
If there's an area in your life where you find ungodliness, just imagine right now a picture which is probably a little bit crude, but it'll be helpful. Imagine yourself just about to to act out in this act of ungodliness and imagine being face to face with Jesus on the cross who's receiving the wrath of God for your sin in mercy. Would you do it? Would you act out in ungodliness looking at his face? It puts it into perspective that as we orient our lives around the cross and the mercy of Jesus, the grace of his first appearing, we are automatically going to begin to be trained to say, no, I don't want to do anything which would bring more blood upon my Savior. I want to live in accordance with that mercy and live in accordance with that forgiveness that he's given me. Crystal, Natalie, do you want to come up and Raph, and then let's pray together as we prepare to sing. Father, I thank you for this word. And I pray, Lord, that even if some of us may have been convicted, Lord, that's a good thing. Um, it's good. Godly conviction is going to bring us to a place of, of repentance. And that's good, Lord. But I also pray, Lord, that um, alongside that conviction would be this great encouragement of recognizing that you, God, have made such a way for us who once were destined for death and hell. You've given us such a, uh, a choice, you could say, an option, a way of life. And be it though it narrow and difficult, Lord, there's so much peace knowing that when we put our faith in the knowledge of the truth of Jesus, which rests on the hope of eternal life, we have nothing to fear, and we know that your Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and walks with us and helps us in our weakness as we await the day that your son Jesus returns to bring about this uh, full and final salvation whereby we can walk with you in eternal life. God, we thank you for all of this. And I just also want to say, Father, and ask you, God, that you would help every single one of us, because there's not one person in this room that is perfectly godly. All of us, there are still areas, Lord, where you are setting us apart more and more and more. So we are asking, God, by your grace, that you would reveal to us those areas where we are not being godly and that you would help us in our faith, help us in our understanding of the true gospel so that we may walk in accordance with you, Father. We want to be in your image and your likeness and follow after your character and your mercy, your compassion, your truth. Help us do that today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Why don't you stand? And Crystal and Adelaide are going to...